Well, we're going to go into the Word of God, so let's always do that with prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity. We ask you, Father, to open our hearts and lives to your Word and your Word to our hearts and lives, that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior as we commit the coming hour and ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord, our Savior, our coming King, in whose name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Well, having gone through a tedious introduction, let's jump right into chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And uh, as you look at the epistles of the New Testament, uh, it's interesting that there are three of them that are a trilogy on Habakkuk 2.4, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews, as we study those three epistles. And uh, Habakkuk 2.4 is, in each of those three, they become a trilogy on Habakkuk uh, 2.4, which says, the just shall live by faith. Who are the just? Well, that's what the book of Romans deals with. In Romans 1.17, this is quoted. Uh, how shall they live? That's what the book of Galatians deals with, call out of religious externalism. And they shall live by faith. And that's, of course, Hebrews. With the, uh, in Hebrews 10.39, this verb, uh, verse is quoted, and then you have the hall of faith that follows and so forth. It's interesting that these epistles that we sometimes take as individuals are actually part of a pattern. And here is a trilogy on Habakkuk 2.4. And that implies, by the way, that Paul wrote all three. A lot of people don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. You really won't understand the book of Hebrews until you discover who really wrote it and why. But in any case, the main point is that there's a pattern here. The Holy Spirit's in control. These were practical letters written by Paul to solve certain problems, and yet we see the fingerprints on the Holy Spirit of how it's organized. So this, they became the, ba battle, the battle cry of the Reformation, if you recall, and so forth, and changed the history of the world, actually. Well... Let's take a look at the book of Colossians. That was written about the same time as Ephesians, as we mentioned before. Ephesians is on the church, the, sometimes called the body of Christ. Colossians is on Christ himself as the head of the body. Ephesians, the prophets, Hebrews, the uh, priest, and uh, Colossians, the king. And here again, we notice that the three of these epistles form a pattern. So I'm always fascinated by these, this architecture because that... Uh, it isn't something that Paul himself may have been conscious of, but the Holy Spirit is certainly guiding. And it's interesting when we study the Bible carefully with computers and so forth, we discover that the Torah has all kinds of pro mathematical properties that dissolve if you take one letter out of it. You begin to realize not only did, what did God give the Torah to Moses, he gave it to him letter by letter. And as you start to see the structure here in the New Testament, we're conscious of design. But in any case, we talked about the basic structure of this epistle of, uh, to the Colossians. Uh, doctrine declared in chapter 1 and uh, the gospel message. And we're, uh, we'll be going through the first two of those. And uh, chapter 2, still doctrinally, the danger of Christ's preeminence being defended against those dangers. And uh, we'll deal with that, of course, in subsequent sessions. And then finally, the last two chapters being the practical application of all of that. But in this coming session, we're going to focus on the first 14 verses of the epistle. So let's just jump in and actually deal with the text. Finally, huh? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother. Thirteen New Testament epistles begin with his name, and he also wrote the Epistle of the Hebrews, and uh, for very good reasons didn't sign it, and uh, that also is consistent with its theme, but that's a whole other study. The 14th, we believe, is written by Paul, so there's 14 by Paul. And uh, incidentally, some Messianics especially get a little uncomfortable with Paul. Let's not lose sight of the fact that Peter himself authenticates Paul and refers to Paul's letters as Scripture, which is interesting, interesting. And so uh, let's keep that in mind. So, uh, and so again, like uh, Paul is associated with Timothy here, his protege of sorts, and uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now that the New Testament 
got its word probably from the Hebrew salah, which means descent. It means the sent one is technically what it means. That term actually is a legal term, strangely enough, implying authorized representation. And uh, as in the modern law of agency, one sent was held to be equivalent to the sender himself in a legal sense. And of course, that's exactly what is intended here in the role. And uh, to dishonor the king's ambassador is to dishonor the king. It's, the, it's sort of the underlying thought here uh, in both the Old and New Testament, it's, it, interestingly enough. Apostle of Jesus Christ. And uh, it has secondary usages, but it primarily deals with those who are directly commissioned as apostles by the risen Lord. We use that term apostle sometimes a little more broadly, but that in its denotative sense is really what it is intended to convey. And so he exercised uh, the function of an apostle by the will of God directly. And of course, the book of Acts details that. Now, Timothy was often with Paul, a young fellow that uh, Paul really adopts in a sense. He had a Gentile father, we learned from Acts 16, but his mother and grandmother were godly Jewesses, and uh, he learned the Old Testament scriptures from childhood. And uh, he, Paul picks him up on his second missionary journey uh, at Lystra, and uh, because he was well spoken of, and so Paul takes him under wing. And so he disciples him and, and wrote two of his last letters, his final letters that were written uh, to Timothy, guiding him and uh, instruction. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting that uh, to the saints and faithful brethren, is that redundant or are they distinctive? And uh, are they different? Well, a saint is it someone uh, that's born into it. You can't join that club. You have to be born into it, right? And uh, faithful brethren, of course, is the response to that call. So you can split hairs here and d say that they're not exactly identical. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now, this is interesting because he's praying for them, and yet these are people he probably had not met. A few he knew, of course, but that, that, that precipitated the letter. But it's interesting. Um, when Paul learns that people uh, come to the Lord, it lengthened his prayer list. He was very, very uh, diligent in his prayer life. And that's part of what we're going to get into here. The prayers of Paul. It's worth your while to take some time sometime and study his prayers. They carry very important lessons. And uh, when compared to the Lord's Prayer, they provide an index to the way Christ's instruction, after this manner, pray ye, as they were applied in the early church. And uh, they have a pattern that's worth understanding. They usually start with an initial thanksgiving, and then that goes into a petition uh, and, uh, and uh, into a paean of praise of the exalted Christ. But he continues, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all saints, of your faith in Christ Jesus. Faith in a person, not a system. It's faith in Christ, not a faith in some kind of doctrine or philosophy. That's Paul's starting right up front here to put Christ forward. That's what we're all about. Our relationship with a person, the person of Jesus Christ. It's interesting, some people say, well, you have to have faith, as if that somehow instinctively is useful. No, you have to have that. It's what you have faith in that's critical. It's not an abstraction. You are relying on something. What is your faith in? It needs to be in a person, the person of Jesus Christ. And uh, so, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have ye heard before in the word of truth, uh, in the uh, word of truth of the gospel? Now, I want you to notice that faith, love, and hope are all linked up. There's a trilogy here that we want to dwell on a little bit. Faith, hope, and love are intimately linked with each other. And uh, obviously the gospel was defined for us in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. You know, it's interesting when you study the first four verses of 1 Corinthians 15, which defines the gospel. We, what is the gospel? We all use that term, good news. Well, no, specifically what it is. It? And Paul defines it for there, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. That's the gospel. You know, what's interesting about that is um, 
It doesn't make any mention of his teachings. Well, he's a great teacher, yeah, but that's not the gospel. That he was a faithful, um, uh, 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 that he, he, uh, an example of some kind, that he did miracles. All those things are not in Paul's definition of the gospel. What is the gospel? That Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He didn't just disappear. He died for our sins according to Scriptures. He fulfilled a hundred different specifications on that cross. That's what makes the the, 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 the issue of the, the movie The Passion captures that, uh, that event in its gruesome detail. But the point is the specifications are very precise. They were laid out before the foundation of the world. And uh, so the gospel, how he died for our sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, only Paul emphasized that because he's going to tie that into baptism. And thirdly, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now when Paul says the scriptures, he's talking about the Old Testament. He died, that he was raised according to, uh, raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Where in the Old Testament do you find the third day defined as his specification for resurrection? Well, the story of Jonah, Jesus links that. Well, that's fair. There's three other places, and I'll leave it to you to dig those out as a student assignment. There's three other places where in the Old Testament it predicts that a, a well-taught rabbi would understand that on the third day he would raise again. So, in any case, uh, and uh, he defines truth in John 17, and of course, Satan being a liar is, uh, is uh, so deemed by Christ himself in John chapter 8. But, uh, where have ye heard before in the word of truth? What Paul saying here, this is before the false teachers were on the surface, so that's what's underlying this time. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel? Okay, we could go ahead and spend a, we could spend an hour on each one of those topics, but we'll move on here. Um, see, false teachers, you know, something else that's incident here. False teachers do not take their message to the world. They go to where the gospel's already gone and try to lead believers astray. It's interesting how many people will ring your doorbell to give you some new truth when they discover you're a Christian. You see, and... Uh, See, the, the false teachers have no good news for sinners. No, no good news for sinners. Now, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, reserved, your, that hope that's set aside for you. Now, it's interesting, the tense of that verb indicates that this hope has once and for all been reserved so that nothing can take it from you. There's a lot of comfort in that, by the way. We can spend a lot of time on that. If you have any doubts about that, Put in your notes Romans chapter 8. Start about verse 28 and just read to the end of the chapter. And anytime you're down, anytime you're kind of unsure, uncertain, just go to Romans chapter 8, start at verse 28, read to the end of the chapter, and you cannot feel bad after going through that tour de force on there. And I, I actually put a tab in my Bible. I ch- check it about once a day to make sure it's still there where it starts, you know. Go, go into that, okay. So we're guarded for glory, Okay. Now, it says, for the hope, which is later, what hope are we talking about? That's a glib word, the hope. What hope are we talking about? The second coming. In Titus, the term, the blessed hope, comes from Titus, comes from a reference to what? His second coming. That's the hope we're talking about. There's not a worthwhile thing to hope for. No, that's the blessed hope. That's the key thing. And uh, so, no one can fully appreciate the gospel if they leave out that particular aspect. We look for a king, and he's uh, soon coming to return. And that's the, that's the kingdom we're all about. Anyway, this little trilogy of uh, faith, hope, and love is a favorite of Paul's. He uses it in 1 Corinthians 13 and 1 Thessalonians elsewhere. And also Peter. They both lean heavily on this little trilogy of faith, hope, and love. What is faith? That's the soul looking upward towards God. What is love? Looking outward to others. And what is hope? That looks forward to the future. That's a, a way to look at the, 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 a paradigm, if you will, of those three. The faith rests on the past work of Christ. It's a done deal. He's completed it. It's finished. You can't add to it. Love works in the present. Love is a now thing. And uh, hope anticipates the future. So it's a past, present, and future situation here, too. Okay. So, without faith, it's impossible to please God. We learned from Hebrews 11.6. 6. 
and hope does not disappoint us, Romans hammers in chapter 5. But a faith, hope, and love, which is the greatest of these? Anyone? Love. Good for you. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest of these is love. So faith is past, content with historical facts. Faith comes from the content of past events, knowing the, knowing the past, knowing what, what's happened for you. Love is, is the present. That's the emblem of our calling. That's how people should identify you as a Christian. By your love, you should be known. And uh, by the way, do you pray for leaders with whom you do not agree? I find that hard. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, right? And, uh, and of course, uh, the, 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 the climactic order in 1 Corinthians we've just re referenced there. And of course, hope is in the future. Continuing verse 6, we're making good progress here. We've got six of our 14 verses behind us here. Which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. You can use this verse if you wanted to, to establish that even in Paul's day, the gospel had been carried to the ends of the earth. Especially when we compare this to verse 23 of this chapter. Small point, but... I'll throw it out there to stir up some controversy among you. And uh, if you were going to give a gift that would be suitable to the whole world, what would you give? Books? Food? Clothing? Money? How about John 3.16? That's the gift, the ultimate gift for the world. And if you don't know which one it is, I'll let you look it up. Okay, we'll let you <laughs> Uh, John Selden was a leading historian and legal authority in England, and he regarded for his learning, he had a, a large personal library of over 8,000 volumes, and as he was dying, he said to Archbishop Usher, quote, I have surveyed most of the learning that is among the sons of men, and my study is filled with books and manuscripts on various subjects, but at present I cannot recollect any passage out of all my books and papers whereon I can rest my soul. Save this from the sacred scriptures, quote, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, close quote. So that's a testimony. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Now here's the reference to Epaphras we've talked about in the introduction a little bit. Um, he's, he, his, his outstanding characteristic apparently, was that of fervency and prayer. It's interesting how many people are remembered as prayer warriors. Uh, this was written about 60 to 62 A.D. In 62 A.D. is when James was martyred. Do you know what James, the brother of our Lord, what his nickname was? Anyone know what James's nickname was? They called him old camel knees <laughs> because he spent so much time in prayer. Anyway, Paphras was in Rome with Paul. He called him a fellow prisoner, which implies he was with Paul in prison, not necessarily imprisoned, but voluntarily joining Paul in his situation. Now, Paphras is a shortening of Epaphroditus that's referred to in the Philippian letter and in a couple of places. And uh, it could be the same person, or it might be a, because it was a common name in that day. And uh, for what that's worth, okay. And you also learned of Paphras, our dear servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Learned of it actually. The word actually means discipled by, discipled by him. That's so used in in other references. Uh, the word disciple is used 260 times in both gospel and Acts. Retaken under wing and trained, if you will. To learn as a, as a disciple is 25 times in the New Testament. What does that really mean? Learning by living. Learning by living. And that's what the fellowship in the local church is all about. Not just to be a witness, but to make disciples. That implies a program. That implies supervision. That implies someone really caring that's, and taking, taking you under wing. Who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Faith cometh by hearing, Paul reminds us in Romans 10, 17. We learn to walk by what? By faith. We learn to work by faith. Each one of these has references uh, 
1 Thessalonians 1, 3, and so on. And faith, of course, gives power to prayer in Luke 17. And faith is our shield against Satan's darts and the armor of God in Ephesians 6, who has also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Love is the evidence of salvation. Love is the evidence of salvation. And uh, see, doctrinal correctness will never atone for a lack of love. And that is the Lord's message in his letter to the Ephesians in Revelation chapter 2. They were very strict on doctrine. Paul had visited the Ephesian elders and uh, warned them that there will be wolves in the flock and the guard against that in Acts chapter 20. When Jesus writes the letter to the Ephesians, they apparently did that well. We don't tolerate them that are, um, that say they're apostles that are not. So they got their doctrinal thing straightened out. But he says, nevertheless, I have something against you. You've lost your first love. They're so busy on the business of the king, they had no time for the king. We've got to guard against that ourselves, that we don't get so busy that we don't have just time for fellowship with them in prayer. Doctrinal correctness will never atone for a lack of love. And uh, it's interesting, this is the only verse in this epistle that mentions the Holy Spirit explicitly. And it is in connection with love, interestingly enough. See, the Holy Spirit never speaks of himself, we're told. In, uh, and, and this is in contrast with Ephesians, where it's all through there. So your prayer life. You know, it's unlikely that any other writer has given us as much insight into our own prayer life as is contained in the following verses. We're going to have some verses here which will give us a glimpse into Paul's prayer life. Verses 9 through 11 will set forth the blessings for which Paul prays, and 12 to 14, the list for which he gives thanks. And they're each different. And some are not forfeitable, and some are blessings for which we need to pray daily. And uh, let's look at these. Verse 9, for this cause, Paul says, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. That's interesting. He did, these are people he hadn't met. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, that they had become Christians, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding with the knowledge, epignosis. And uh, that act, the term actually in the Greek means a super. Gnosis is knowledge. Epignosis is super knowledge, if you will. And Paul is deliberately using this term in contrast to the Gnostics which claimed that they had superior knowledge. No, your superior knowledge is what Paul, is, is what Paul can boast about because it comes from Christ. And it's a coined word, if you will. And uh, it's the keynote of Paul's reply to the conceit of Gnosticism. And uh, the, the cure for these intellectual upstarts is not ignorance, not obscurantism, but more knowledge of the will of God. That's the way you eclipse that, really, in effect. And all, with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We're talking spiritual wisdom, Sophia in the Greek. It's used six times in this epistle. And it really refers to the practical knowledge which comes from God. And so James uh, 1, 5 and other places. Wisdom and spiritual understanding, synesis, which is also used in chapter 2 in Colossians, which speaks of clear analysis and decision-making in applying this knowledge to various problems. So they're closely related, but yet still distinctive. See, the false teachers, in contrast, offered only the appearance of wisdom. Uh, which captivated their minds and lives of, in legalistic regulations. But true spiritual wisdom is both stabilizing and liberating, not putting them in bondage, which is really what they were doing. Truth is not learned through intellect alone. And Paul emphasizes neither an abstract intellectualism nor an occult experience in powers and such. Uh, 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 he, he, but, uh, but rather a thorough knowledge of God's will in accordance with his wisdom and perception, which he goes on with here. And uh, Now in using these terms, Paul is deliberately picking up the language, the vocabulary, if you will, of the Gnostics. But he turns the meaning of those words against his false teachers. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. That should be one of our prayers, right? To increase the knowledge of God. That ye might walk worthy. 
Walking worthy of your vocation. Ephesians 4 deals with that. Walking worthy of the gospel. Philippians 1. Walking worthy of God. 1 Thessalonians 2. These are common themes in all of Paul's letters. Faith is understanding step, and understanding is faith's reward, according to Augustine. Good quote. The end of all knowledge is conduct. That's Lightfoot's approach, and I think that's a... The end of all knowledge is conduct. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, and uh, that's not found in any other passage in the New Testament. The Greek uses it. It's a preference of the will of others before our own, according to uh, Thomas. And uh, now that's uh, the, the term that comes close to this is fiduciary, putting somebody else's interests ahead. And the word for fiduciary in the Greek is koinonia, koinonia, which is from which we get the name of our ministry. But uh, being fruitful in every good work, and uh, every good work, um, everything in a believer's life is sacred. There is no secular. We think of things that divide the world in secular, sacred and secular. Not in a believer's life. Everything in a believer's life should be sacred. There is no secular. And uh, I sound like Yoda, don't I? And, uh, you do or you do not, there is no try, right? <laughs> Okay, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Now, the same dynamic that raised Jesus from the dead operates in us, the Holy Spirit. That's quite a statement and quite a thing to grasp. That's one reason that I think many of us that are people of the book, as the Muslims might say, people of the Bible, uh, we don't celebrate a crucified Christ. We celebrate a risen Christ. And there's a distinction. There's a distinction. The same power, the same dynamic that raised Christ from the dead operates in each of us. That's breathtaking. That was uh, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, Strength of all might according to his glorious power unto all patience. Not with stoical uh, tolerance, but with joyfulness. Joyfulness is always associated with patience, interestingly enough. Joyfulness isn't gaiety or happiness. Joyfulness is, is, the, is the, the pleasant fruit of patience. And uh, the joy of the Lord is your strength, Nehemiah tells us, and so it goes. So endurance and patience are often associated, uh, idiomatically at least. Hope of a nail, the, the, the remaining under implies not easily succumbing under suffering. So suffering is implicit here. And patience, macrothumia, is a long temper, is technically what it says. Really really means self-restraint that does not hastily retaliate. And uh, a lack of endurance often results in despondency or losing heart, whereas a lack of patience often leads to wrath or revenge. And uh, so, a lack of endurance results in despondency or losing heart, if you lack endurance. But lacking patience leads to an impulsive act of some kind. It's a thought, anyway. And uh, at work in the Christian is no less than the power of Almighty God Himself. Wow. Not at present to exalt, but to give patience, fortitude, and endurance. The Stoic philosophers also enjoined these virtues, but like the traditional poker-faced Indian, coupled them with an attitude of complete detachment. And uh, Paul here means hopeful waiting and suffering with joyfulness. He ties the joyfulness to that. This is the Christian distinctive. Joy, not rooted in the soil of suffering, is shallow, he, he argues. Now, the following things that he's praying for, we already have. And we simply express thanksgiving for them. Some would argue that praying for these is to dishonor God by casting doubt upon His Word. I don't go that far, but some people look at it that way. Verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of saints in light. And we're going to get this light and darkness thing coming up. And we also have a word in, introduced here called inheritance. I'm going to suggest that many of us have no grasp of what this is really all about. We're going to defer getting into that until we get to chapter 3, where we're going to get into inheritance and how, how does that differ from some of the other blessings that uh, come our way. So 
giving uh, thanks to the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And so, now this is the beginning of a list of things which, for which Paul is thankful. And all of our prayers should be filled with thanksgiving. That sounds so basic, but let's not forget that. That's, prayer is God's way of enlisting you in what He is doing. And one way to do that is to be thankful for what He's already done. And of course, inheritance, it actually is of the lot, or for our share of the lot. It's, an, it's a very old word. It, at first, it, a pebble or piece of wood used in casting lots was the thought here. And then it became the allotted portion or inheritance as here. And we'll deal, develop this more specifically uh, in chapter 3 and uh, verse 24. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I want you to notice there's a translation going on here from darkness to light. We're going to talk about the kingdom as we go here a bit. That's part of what's saying. He hath, del- he hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated the kingdom. He hath translated. The word is used to describe the deportation of a population from one country to another. That's what the word in the Greek means. And you and I have been trans- you know, have translated us. We're now in a different domain, in a different, among a different group. We've, we've uh, been deported from one population to another. And that term, uh, history records the fact that Antiochus the Great, that's Antiochus the Third, not Antiochus Epiphanes, anyway, he transported at least 2,000 Jews from Babylonia to Colossae. That's, a, that's just a historical note here. And uh, the kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness. We use those terms frequently. Paul will use that especially in 1 Thessalonians 5. That uh, that the, the, the coming of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. To everybody, no. He comes as a thief in the night to those who are in darkness. But you are children of the day, not of the night, that that day should overtake you as a thief. In other words, the believer will not be surprised when Christ returns. You don't set dates, you don't know when he's going, but you won't be surprised. It, it's a it, very interesting distinctive. No, it's in what Paul is really doing. They're not dealing with eschatology here so much as dealing with the Gnostics. He's saying he's ruling out this whole system of eons and angels that the Gnostics uh, placed above Christ. It is Christ's kingdom in which he is king. He, is, uh, he has moral and spiritual sovereignty. And uh, he, uh, he's putting Christ above these angels and whatever that the, the Gnostics uh, felt they should be worshiping. And the kingdom he's talking about here is one that is going to be established, and it's going to be established on the earth, by the way. I won't get into this in detail here, but I'll highlight one thing to you. The term kingdom of heaven is only used by Matthew, not Mike, Mark, Luke, and John. They use the term kingdom of heaven, which is an all-inclusive term. Kingdom of heaven is denotative, and it's a an, an genitive of source, not a genitive of apposition. What do I mean by that? It's the kingdom from heaven. So don't confuse it with heaven. It's a kingdom on the earth. It has a capital. It has a, a floor, the floor plan of the palaces in Ezekiel 40 through 48. He's going to be on the earth. And uh, we need to understand that. And this little parenthesis we call life is our boot camp to prepare us for the responsibilities that will be assigned us then. And that's what we'll get into some of that as we go forward here a little bit. Light and darkness. They're common theological items, and terms that are used in many religions. And found even as recently in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And Paul is contrasting the realm or sphere of the new age, his new age, the age of light, with that of the present age, the evil sphere, or exousia, if you will, of darkness. We're in the current age is darkness. We have been translated into the light. And uh, elsewhere, the evil sphere of darkness is equated with the power of Satan. And, uh, well... It's so easy to go from any one of these things into a whole bunch of digressions because in our corollary study, the origin of evil, we get into the gap theory and the, the fact that... Uh, no, I've not even start. Let's go. <laughs> okay. It's interesting that when you're talking about dark and light that the Hebrew term through Genesis is Erev and Boker. The evening and the morning were the first day, or day one, not first day, day one, and so forth. Erev and Boker for six days. On the seventh day, there is no Erev and Boker. So those terms originally meant going from darkness to light in the sense of steps of entropy reduction, steps of, of, of uh, creation. And they come to mean then 
darkness or obscurity, that term t tends to mean night, Erev. And Boker, the light, the morning, when you can, things start to become clear, the Erev and Boker process of just becomes evening and morning in the Hebrew language. And uh, it's interesting, in Genesis, that profiles each step of creation in six steps. The seventh day is still a day, but it, there was no Erev and Boker. That is, no creative act, act to, took place there. And uh, now it's interesting, as Gentiles, we reckon the days not from night to morning, the way the Hebrew calendar does, darkness to light, which is what it celebrates. We measure our days from midnight to midnight, from darkness to darkness. Interesting. I wouldn't make too much of that, but I think that's, that's interesting. Okay. And uh, so obviously we have just published this study in the kingdom the power and the glory, which deals with this kingdom that's going to be on the earth, ruled by Christ himself. Okay, well, that's an Old Testament idea. No, that's what Gabriel told Mary when he announced the birth of Christ, that he would be on the throne of David. The throne of David didn't exist in those days. Rome ruled the world. And uh, when you get to the pivotal event of the book of Acts, James quotes Amos 9, uh, 9 10, and 11, that uh, the tabernacle of David, not the temple, the tabernacle of David will be established once again, and so forth. So we need to understand that even at the ascension, Sabbath asks, are you going to set up the kingdom now? He says, not for you to know the time. He doesn't say he's not going to do it, but that's not, their, that's not of their concern. He's coming to set up a kingdom on the earth, and it's going to affect every one of us. And uh, we, every day that he tallies, uh, tarries, every day that he waits a little bit, gives us an extra day to repair our report card. Amen. We'll be getting that here uh, in the study too. Anyway, moving on. Paul continues, verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Wow. The forgiveness of sins. And because we have been forgiven, we can forgive others. That conditional isn't on us. It's the reason we should be forgiving others. It's not that you won't be forgiven if you don't forgive others. That's many people misunderstand that. No, we've been forgiven. It's a done deal. We'll be talking about that. But it's because that's a done deal we can have the freedom to exercise that to others. And that's important. And the, the parable of the unforgiving servant makes it clear that the unforgiving spirit always leads to bondage. You forgive somebody so you unhook your bondage to him for that, unforg for, for that unforgiveness will put you in bondage. That's one of the things my, I've, I've learned from my wife in her first book, The Way of Agape is that the most dangerous hurts you have are the justified ones because they're the hardest to let go. Someone that's wronged you and it's your, your feelings are really justified are the dangerous ones because you won't let those go. The easy ones, well, that's fine, no problem. Those aren't the dangerous ones. Dangerous ones where you're really, you've really been wronged. No. Those are the ones you want to get rid of the bondage by forgiving, because you're doing yourself the favor by forgiving him, because you're releasing that bondage. That's a very, very profound thing to grab hold of and practice. But uh, anyway, these verses, which posit a past deliverance and transference into Christ's kingdom, you're in that kingdom now. It isn't established on the earth yet, but it will be, but you are in that kingdom now. It's a past deal. A redemption which Christians have as a present possession. You've been redeemed. You may not feel any different. He's done it. These are all hallmarks in, in Paul's language here of a realized eschatology. Eschatology is a study of the last things. And we think of eschatology, well, that's the second coming. And then, no, no. You have, your eschatology is realized. It's done. It's accomplished. It's a done deal. And... Uh, so the actual new age arrived with Christ's resurrection. That started the real new age. And Christians enter it at conversion. You enter that when you've accepted Christ. You accepted Christ. You haven't changed yet. That's a whole other story we'll get to. But you are saved, nailed. What did you contribute to that? Nothing. To try to add to that is blasphemy. Hard thing to get across. We'll get to that important. In fact, foundational issues. There are some issues we need to deal with. I would 
almost put it in the introduction, but I would have run too long, so I've just left. This is a good place to sort of repair this. If you've been through Learn the Bible in 24 Hours, our, which is our, sort of our preliminary, a lot of this will be familiar to you. Uh, if you've been through some of the other epistles, this will be a review for you, but it's worth, well, time well spent. I want to talk about the paradigm of salvation, the whole issue of eternal security, and the origin of evil. That should take care of the afternoon, huh? <laughs> the paradigm of salvation. You know, in, within the Institute, we don't let our students use the term salvation because it's confusing. Earl Rademacher always used to come in the office and says, I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. And he used to say that deliberately to, conf bring, to confuse people. Are you saved? Past or present or future? What is it? All three and they're different. The paradigm, I'll call it, like a verb thing. Okay. Past tense is called justification. What is justification? The gift of God of everlasting life received by faith alone in Christ Jesus. That says it all. Lots of verses on that. You can d d check them out. What is, when we use the term justification, it's a gift. You don't buy it. You can't earn it. It's a gift of God of everlasting life that you receive by faith alone. If you believe it, you trust it, you have it. It's done. Deal. You haven't earned it. It's a gift. The present tense of self, that's past tense. Present tense is sanctification. What is that? A work in progress that involves the faith and the works of the believer. My justification is secure. Christ accomplished it on a cross 2,000 years ago. My sanctif I'm a work in progress. We all are. I'm a work in progress. God is not finished with me yet. And I won't give you a list of the things that he's still working on me on. There's plenty of them. And... Uh, I'm a weird one. I lose my temper at inanimate objects. <laughs> when a drawer sticks or hit my thumb with a hammer or something, my behavior is abominable. Now, there's probably worse things I could do too, but I, I, I'm amazed at myself that I can get so angry at inanimate objects. But anyway, and there are other things, but I'll spare you that. Sanctification, a work in progress, that's present tense. Glorification, that's the future tense. That's the result of the previous aspects. Okay. Now, all believers will be glorified. He reminds us in Romans 8, one of the, your security is all, extends all the way through sanctification to glorification. That's a shock to many theologians. All believers will be glorified, that is, resurrected and given a body like Christ. But some will have more glory or reward than others, and we'll get to that in the subsequent aspect here. So we have the past tense of salvation. That's separated from the penalty of sin. We call that justification, past tense. You're separated from the penalty of sin. When you accept Christ, your passport to heaven is stamped. Not guilty. Innocent. You haven't changed yet. Why? Christ has paid for it all. You follow me? That's justification. Past tense. Present tense is separation from the power of sin. If you're an unbeliever, you are in bondage to sin. If you're a believer, you have a resource that can keep you from sin. You may not invoke it as much as you should. You may still stumble, but you have power over that. You're separated from the power of sin. That's called sanctification. You can call upon the Holy Spirit to get rid of an addiction or whatever else. If unbeliever can, a believer can. And uh, the future tense, of course, is separation from the presence of sin altogether. And we call that glorification. Past tense, separation from the penalty of sin, justification. Present tense, separation from the power of sin over your life. And future tense, separation from the very presence of sin, and of course that's yet future. And uh, so, these three terms, justification, we use instead of salvation, because salvation is ambiguous. I was saved from a burning fire last week. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about soteriological salvation. And yet, what are we talking about? Past tense, present tense, future tense. So we use those three terms instead. It's more precise. One of the things that will advance you in your study of the Bible is to be very precise. Be very strict with the text. Take the text seriously. God means what He says and says what He means to astonishing precision. And so be, respect that precision and uh, you'll get further. So these three terms are the past, present, future of the term that we use loosely, sloppily, salvation. Justification is for us. Sanctification is in us. Justification declares the sinner righteous. Sanctification makes the sinner righteous. 
the justification removes the guilt and penalty of sin, and sanctification removes the growth and power of sin. Distinctive. They're very different. Okay, let's go to the next one. Eternal security. Can you lose your salvation? Boy, that'll divide the audience. I won't ask for a show of hands. Let's see what Jesus says about the subject. John 6, Jesus says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Wow, that's quite an invitation. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Wow. Okay. If you can lose your salvation, Jesus lost something more than you have. He's lost his good name. I should lose nothing, see? That's his, that's his boast he can make to the Father. It gets even deeper than that. We could go on and on on the subject. We've done a whole two-hour study on it. It's available in our little package. I'll hang the, my hat on this one example in John 10. It's my favorite example. John 10, verse 28 and 29. Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Look at that carefully. Out of my hand, Jesus says, and my Father's hand. There are two hands here. I see it like this, or like this. I'm in there. Do you think I could get out if I tried? I don't think so. I'm a man, and no man can pluck them out of either the Son or the Father's hand. Okay? Now, if you can lose your salvation, I have a new name for God. Butterfingers. <laughs> That's sort of a Walter Martin kind of crack. I can't, Walter was a dear friend, and I, I can't resist, you know, uh, leaning on his sort of irreverent style here, but the thing is you'll always remember that won't you? You see. And we build our case for eternal security on all three members. The Son guarantees your salvation. The Holy Spirit, uh, the Father, uh, in fact, at the, in John 17, when Jesus is praying to the Father, He hands that responsibility to the Father. And of course, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. All three members of the Godhead are committed to protecting your salvation. So you are secure. Now, that, uh, and by the way, uh, as I say, we have a whole study on that. If this, is a, if this is still a problem for you, I encourage you to don't let the sun go down on that insecurity. You, if you're in Christ, you are secure because it's His responsibility, not yours. He did it on the cross. You didn't add anything to that. And how many of your sins were yet future when He hung on that cross? All of them. Exactly right. All of them. He paid for all of them. Well, let's go to the origin of evil. Why is there evil in, in, in this world if creation was made by a holy God? That's one of the things that really messes up the, uh, Judaism and the Kabbalah, and we'll get to that in, the, in a later hour. Um, and that's also got the Gnostics. They had this whole theory about that uh, uh, the entrance of evil, the nature of evil, and so forth. And see, the philosophers came to the wrong conclusion that all matter was evil. All matter is evil. No, matter isn't evil or not evil. That's nothing. The, their false conclusion was that a holy God could not come into contact with evil matter, so there had to be a series of emanations from God uh, to his creation. And they believe that a, 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 in, a, a, in a powerful uh, spirit world that used material things to attack mankind. They made that distinction, all evil. And that led to these ascetic and strange practices. They also held to a form of astrology, believing that angelic beings ruled the heavenly bodies and influenced affairs on earth and so forth. It all builds from this strange kind of separation thing, if you will. So since to them matter was evil, they had to find some way to control their own human natures in pursuit of perfection. And two different practices emerges from this false concept. One school of thought held that the only way to conquer evil matter was by means of rigid discipline and asceticism. So they conjured up all these weird 
things in life to somehow deal with the evilness that was around them. And uh, the other view was taught that it was permissible to engage in all kinds of sin, since matter was evil anyway. It appears that the first opinion was the predominant one in Colossae, but there's two opinions. When you speak of Gnosticism, by the way, there's all kinds of shapes and sizes. It's very difficult to research this and compartmentalize it because they really, it has all kinds of convolutions. But matter is not evil. The human body is not evil. Each person is born with a fallen human nature that wants to control the body and use it for sin, but the body itself is not evil. And uh, if that were the case... Jesus Christ would never come to earth in a a human body. That tells you volumes right there. And uh, nor would he have enjoyed uh, the uh, 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 everyday blessings of life that ministered on the earth, such as attending wedding feasts and accepting invitations to dinner and so forth. Those aren't evil things. Uh, Diets and disciplines can be good for one's health, but they have no power to develop true spirituality, to separate the two issues doesn't mean that diets and those things can't be good, even exercise, well, that, fine, but it doesn't have anything to do with your spiritual life. So, Gnosticism, their concept was spiritual perfection by mixtures of legalism, rules, mysticism of all kinds, and we'll, deal, we'll be dealing with some of those in the next hour, special rites and ceremonies, Eastern philosophic thought, diet-based commitments, These are all false concepts deriving from their views, erroneous views, of the origin of evil. Uh, Legalism comes the Messianic Judaizers. You find them today. Uh, Nothing's more exciting than a Messianic Jew, a Jew that has discovered his Messiah. It's marvelous. And yet, many of them are still under the law. They they haven't studied the book of Romans. They haven't studied, I don't think the book of Galatians is in their Bible somehow. And mysticism. That's a strange term to use, but all kinds of Christians are chasing experience-based phenomenon. Gold dust or whatever, you know. You can almost build a a panorama of what's weaving through the culture. People who, once you start looking for experiences, rather than relying on the Word of God, you're inviting this bizarre results. The origin of evil. We have a full study on that that gets into the gap theory and all that stuff also. You might find kind of fun. So So these heretics then are in effect attacking the person and work of Jesus Christ. And to them he is merely one of God's many emanations and not the very Son of God come in the flesh. That's the, Every cult will attempt to deny that. The incarnation means God with us, we learn in Matthew chapter 1. But these false teachers claim that God was keeping his distance from us. No, it's just the opposite. Just the opposite. And uh, when we trust the Son of God, there is no need for intermediary beings between us and heaven. You have nobody. You don't have to go to Christ's mother to get access. Okay. So. Christian believers need to be cautious that they don't mix their Christian faith with other things like yoga or transcendental meditation, oriental medicine. You don't mix these things. To do so is to dethrone Christ. To do those kinds of things is to to imply that Christ is not sufficient in himself. Beware of the so-called deeper life teachers who offer a system for victory and fullness that bypasses devotion to Christ himself. That's what it's all about. All these other things are distractions, diversions. And... uh, in all things, Christ must have preeminence. Preeminence. The ultimate reality, in his work on the cross, Jesus Christ settled the sin question once and for all. And he completely defeated all satanic forces. And uh, he put an end to the legal demands of the law. That's it. Astonishing, astonishing statement. He put an end to the legal demands by fulfilling them himself on your behalf. So trying to keep the law is to imply he didn't complete it for you. That's a form of blasphemy, interestingly enough. Jesus Christ alone is the preeminent one and all that the believer needs is Jesus. You don't need angels, you don't need these other things from this point of view at least. Okay, so we have 
managed our way through the first 14 verses. Um, and now the fun begins. This has been typical preachy stuff so far, right? Review for most of you. But we're now going to move into the second half of chapter 1, which includes some of the most astonishing statements in the entire Bible about the creation and the church itself uh, in the next session. So in your next session, I want you to study carefully verses 15 through 29 of chapter 1. And I want to ask, as you do this, I want you to think about what are the boundaries of our physical reality? You know, we have, we have boundaries. We live, you know, in the UK, and you know, we have, a, we have a, a sense of where we are. Well, let's broaden that. Where are we physically? What, what are our boundaries in total? The great discovery of 20th century science is the universe is finite, not infinite. That's a shock. Because that leads to the whole idea that it had a beginning. That's what leads to the Big Bang conjectures, those kinds of things. That the universe is finite in the macrocosm, and it's finite in the microcosm. What does that mean? Be thinking on those things. And what are the implications of that? It will astonish you to realize the nature of the physical reality as we now have ex understand it. And so, and that all leads to another question. Why is the section we're moving into, the last half of chapter 1, regarded as the most elevated view in the New Testament? Most elevated view, the highest pinnacle of truth that you can find in the New Testament will show up in this epistle next time. Watch for it. Coming to a Bible study near you. <laughs> Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the extremes that you've gone to that we might live. We thank you, Father, for calling us for making us aware of your presence, for making us aware of what you have already done and committed on our behalf. We do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit and through your word, you might help us to apprehend this incredible gift that you've arranged for us. We do pray, Father, that you would help each of us to grow in grace and knowledge of our preeminent one, our coming King, in whose name we do pray. Amen.